Welcome to the Financial Liberty Podcast. Until you wake up from the American dream, financial uncertainty will be your American reality. Join Sam Legaspi and Ko Sukamoto and their guests as they explore how you can attain financial liberty by uncovering truths that have been kept secret for decades. Have you ever played a game and didn't know the rules? How can you ever win? Learn the rules to the game and in turn, learn how to win. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to the Financial Liberty Project with Sam Legaspi and Ko Sukamoto. Today we are talking about testing your retirement IQ. That's the title at least. Now, I'm pretty interested. I hate tests personally. I didn't do very well on them in school, but uh, I think this test is a little easier, I hope. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning. Doing good great. Good morning. And you know what? I wasn't uh, very good on in, in exams either. I like to take Scantron tests because mm-hmm. uh, it was a lot easier for me to handle multiple choice tests. I would probably say I was a pretty good test taker. I was pretty good at it too. Yeah. When it came yeah, to well, a blue my, book, it sucks. My technique was uh, you have four multiple choice. So you've got four fingers. You slam them all on the edge of the table. And whichever one hurt, that was your answer. Hmm. Oh, I like that one. It worked. I never did that. I just went ahead and I just looked over to the person on my left and said, hey, let me see your yeah. test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't score very high on the SAT, but when I was hiring as an engineering project manager, I learned to steer clear of the people that scored a 1600 on their SAT. They just, you know, of course, we, we can't generalize, but a lot of them had personality issues. They had problems getting along with people. So hmm. I learned that, uh, that the best people to hire were the A minuses and the B pluses and the Bs. That, that was like the sweet spot. Yeah, well, and the C's too. Don't forget the yeah, C's. Yeah, don't forget the C's. Right? <laughs> don't forget the C's. Hey, come on, man. Don't forget the C's over here. Uh, yeah. All right, so uh, what are we doing today, guys? Well, you know, we, we're talking um, a lot of times. A lot of times you've got situations that go on in, in life where people are about to retire and maybe it could be five years, 10 years. And I just had this conversation with you, Coz, yesterday. I was talking to a few people on the phone and uh, asking them what would they do different uh, had they had the opportunity 10 years ago to retire once again. And they were spinning out of just uh, several things. And, and we figured, you know what, it'd probably be really cool to uh, have a show on, you know, testing your retirement intelligence and uh, figuring out what you might want to do before you actually retire a good five, 10, it's 15 really years. simple. Take the stupid out of money, the stupid out of life, the stupid out of our decision makings. And um, yeah, that's, that's it. Just be smart 100% of the time. So easy to do, right? I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> Consistency is key, really. Yeah. You know, I, I got to tell you, I mean, so I was, I was, everyone we talked to, right? I mean, it's 7, 10, 15, 20 years later. And uh, we tell them that, you know, we're going to have you on the show one day and we're going to ask, ask you to answer questions as to what would you do different? And a lot of people always say there's not one individual that says I would do nothing different. Everything's going to remain the same. Everyone says that they would do something significantly different. It's not even a small thing. It's actually big, right? Because I mean, it's a huge thing that they would do different. And you know, it's it's, it's all it's all mental though. It's just like anything else we do in life, right? Everything that we decide to do from minute to minute is done psychologically. Our brains are geared to do certain things, make certain decisions, and they are a byproduct of our upbringing our biases that we accumulate throughout life and experiences. And for some reason, 95% of the population ends up making really bad money decisions because of that. You know, it's, 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 it's our programs. It's a programs, right? But also cause it's this too. It's, you know, you, you take a look at a lot of, uh, I think Harvard did a study or was it Yale? One of those two schools, they did a study and it illustrated that the majority of people that go on vacation, Right, the the day before they go on vacation, they're the most productive that they are in, in several There's months. More time spent planning vacations than the longest vacation in anyone's life. Yeah, that's it, a statistically proven fact. Right, but but even more so, if you push it, is that people? Let's say you're about to go on to a, a one week trip to Hawaii, and it's Saturday, it's it's Friday, and you're leaving tomorrow. You are more productive on that Friday, making sure everything gets done. The company's bills are paid. Uh, payrolls taken care of, client uh, matters are handled. You are more productive on that Friday because you because you're do, excited. Well, you're excited. You're energized. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, because you're you're getting the heck out of and, Dodge, and man. you don't want the, you don't <laughs> want the phone calls coming in no. during and yeah during the vacation to interrupt the nirvana that you're experiencing on your trip. Yeah, and here's the thing too. 
the day before people leave on the longest vacation they have is when they start reaching out to people to try to figure out what to do, right? They try to, hey, I want you to be as productive as you possibly can, guys, because I'm going on a 35-year vacation. How do I do this? Uh, it's yeah. going to be pretty hard, man. Well, especially if you've got mistakes that they've made over the last 30 years and you can't reverse it. Well, here's, here's, here's the classic one, right? We, we spoke to this one guy and he was at one of our workshops a, a few months ago. He goes, so, you know, sitting back, you know, arms folded, legs folded, just, you know, in a really nice looking suit, just looked like a heavy professional, you know, very, very intelligent, really smart dude sitting in the back. Yeah, like he should be smoking a stogie or something back there, really astute looking. And he comes to us afterwards and he looks, he goes, hey, so what would you do with $50,000? how would I retire off of $50,000? Can I generate $5,000 a month? And I remember we were looking at him going, sorry, man, eh? that ain't going to happen. And I mean, the funny thing was, is that he was serious. You know, I mean, there are people out there. That, that just happened less than a week ago, Sam. I spoke with an individual who had left a company at, at a time in her life where uh, it was before she's able to financially retire. So she had like another 10 years, at least 10 more years to work. Well, she only left the company with about, let's just say about $100,000. And today that $100,000 has been spent down to $7,000. Seven, huh? And this individual has a medical issue and, and Sam's got a medical issue right now as well. He's trying to clear his throat, but he'll be back. Yeah, a little mouse in there. So this individual has spent down $100,000 to $7,000 and calls us up and says, can I still grow my $7,000 because I can't work anymore? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to laugh, but it was like, I didn't understand the circumstances. And I'm like, well, why can't you work anymore? You're still, you know, you still have 10 more years before you should be retiring. Well, the person has a very serious illness. It's a, it's a blood disease, cannot work and can't get a job. And if, even if she got one, she wouldn't be able to keep it. And she's got $7,000 in retirement. I don't care how, what your lifestyle is, that's not going to work. And even with social security, uh, which she's getting as permanent disability, it ain't going to happen. So she's got to figure out how to get to $400,000 in the next 10 years without a job. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's tough. It's, and this it's, is real life stuff. So, you know, we're talking about IQ today, but, you know, it was very clear that this person had this false understanding that she might be able to make $7,000 grow to 400000 in 10 years by not working and by not putting any money away. Right. There's a lack of IQ there because I had to explain to her, hey, you've got to put at least $200,000 in there to have you know a pretty good chance of having that thing grow to 400000 by the time 10 years rolls by. How are you going to do that? That was a one-hour discussion I ended up having with, with a person who – you know, no offense meant, but her IQ was very problematic. She just did not have an understanding that it was important to put money aside. And, you know, in the conversation I had with a couple of people yesterday, a very similar story. And uh, I mean, they had a few more dollars than she did uh, or that she does. However, uh, what, one thing that really stands to mind is they really are are wondering, well, you know what? I really screwed up. They actually admitted, you know, they, I really screwed up. I really did over the past 20, 25 years. I really screwed up. One couple told me they, they said they made about $150,000 a year over the past 30 years combined. Yeah. And that 150000 turns out to, if you over a 30 year period, that's four and a half million dollars in earnings. Right. So it's completely normal for anyone pretty much to be able to make anywhere from, you know, two to $5 million throughout their lifetime, right? Easy. 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 I mean, you, yeah, you get an individual uh, like them. I mean, they're a married couple, 150000 four and a half million dollars. And, uh, it, you know, they, when that number was calculated, they both were like, what in the world? I mean, what? I can't believe that we made that much and really don't have a heck of a whole lot to show for it. And so, you know, it comes back down. They, they were apologizing, not to me, but to themselves. And they were saying, geez, I mean, I'm sorry. We just didn't know. We didn't know. And we weren't smart about this. We made bad choices. And you know what? The choice ultimately was theirs. But at the same time, and I told them this, you know, this is not necessarily your fault. So a lot of these people out there that uh, don't necessarily have the amount of money that they need to have in order to live the rest of the last third of their life in pure happiness and joy, it's not their fault that they didn't save or they didn't put together a plan 
to grow this money, to reach critical mass for this money to grow and grow and grow, to take care of them throughout the last one third of their lives. It's not their fault because you look at it, it's a mixture of society because society is constantly trying to tug at our wallets. They're trying to tug at our purses and they're trying to have us open up our pocketbooks at every instance. And case in point, you go to any grocery store. If you're listening right now, you go to any grocery store, you go through a checkout line and there's always the grab stuff, the things that are very easy to grab that are only a dollar or two dollars, such as gum, candy. They're constantly psychologically trying to attract us to spend more money. And God forbid we're bringing our kids to the grocery stores with us. It's going to be very rare for a parent to say, no, on a regular basis to a kid that says, can I have this? It's only a dollar. It's, it's two for two dollars or two for a dollar, whatever it might be. And sometimes we have the discipline to say no. And sometimes we just don't have the discipline. And, you know, we have two or three kids. We're probably going to have to take care of all three kids and buy three, four, five, six candy bars, but they're grab materials. And it's just what I'm saying is that society is positioned to extract money from us on a constant and regular basis. So it's not your fault if you haven't gotten to the point where you need to be. Absolutely. So how do we raise someone's IQ so that that doesn't continue to be their situation? You know, so by raising it, we have a few questions that you should probably be writing down if you're listening to this episode today. And these questions we're going to go over and we're going to answer it a little bit. But uh, with the time that we have, we're going to go ahead and provide this information and hopefully provide you with as many questions as you possibly can so that when you are at that point in life, five or 10 years, we say what we call is the retirement red zone. And that's that zone in, in the football field within the 20 yard line is that you're sh- you should be scoring either three points or seven po- or six points in a field goal. Uh, and in the retirement situation, there is that retirement red zone where you're really close to scoring that touchdown. You're really close to finishing up, uh, finishing off and winning, you know, scoring some points. And uh, if you're in that zone, which is anywhere in what our definition is five to seven years, could be at 10 years, but you want to get things prepared. And the very first thing you got to do is start asking yourself some serious questions, yourself as well as your spouse. So one of the very first things that we like to go ahead and mention to people is that, you know, these questions that constantly come up is what amount of money, I mean, I think this is the first one, is what amount of money do you need to live off of? That's one of the very first things because people just don't understand. It's such a vague question, right? Because it's like, well, I, I don't understand. What do you mean? What, what amount of money do I need to live off of? It's the amount. And, and most people will not really know the answer. And so we'll say, well, okay, to the nearest thousands, can you answer the question? And again, it's, I don't know. And so a lot of people don't have an understanding of what their budget is, what their actual spending is. And so that's one of the pieces that you have to get smart about is you've got to start tracking not down to the penny, but you got to get a pretty good idea of what your outflow is throughout right. the month. Right. A lot of people say, you know, like, like how much money do you need to put away? And, you know, there's a standard number that I've actually heard people say, oh, you need 300 or maybe 500. And it really is a situation depending on the debt load that you have. We've seen people, right? Because we've seen people with far less than a million dollars in retirement assets actually have a wonderful retirement. And a lot of it's based off the amount of spending that they assume on a monthly basis. Because let's face it, if you got to service $3,000 a month in debt off of $500,000, it's going to be pretty tough for you to retire, right? Yeah. So I think people really need to focus on how much money do they need. So let's just say you've got 25 years of employment wherever you're working. You want to retire at 30, 30 years. So you ask yourself, what amount of money do I need to live off of? You know, actually, this is kind of interesting. I bet I heard this guy say this uh, was a couple of weeks ago, who indicated that maybe people should take a test run and take their vacation and one week vacation, like a one week vacation from their work and actually live as though they're retired. So stay at home. Don't go to Copa San Lucas. Just stay home. And try to live and without try, working. And try to live without working. And the longer you can, if you've accumulated, let's say, two weeks worth of vacation or maybe four weeks, take two weeks and you and your spouse or your significant other can take those two weeks off together and not go on lavish vacations or a vacation, but actually take those two weeks and live and test drive retirement. Right. Now, in doing that, a person who doesn't have an idea of what their budget is could do a couple of possible things. They can get an app and start tracking what their expenses are. It takes a little bit of work, but there are some apps out there. Um, another possibility is to just download your banking information. 
wherever you bank at, just go online and you can download your transactions. And a lot of the downloads actually come with categories, right, Sam? Right. And so you can get a pretty good idea pretty quickly within minutes of what your spending is for a one month, two month period. And that'll give you an idea. You know, that's one of the steps you can take. If you don't know what your spending is, just go ahead and use the app approach or download some banking information. You know, another thing too is um, number two, uh, another question that you want to ask yourself right before you retire and you're in that retirement red zone is uh, what percentage of your gross salary, including employer contributions, should you actively be saving towards retirement? And this is really not a retirement red zone question because this is actually just a general, you know, how much money should you be putting away towards retirement? question. And uh, the sooner you know the answer to this, the better. Because a lot of times we see people, what, when it comes to contributing to the retirement plan, they only contribute to what? The max that they can to uh, maximize the benefits of the company matching. Exactly. Which typically is like in many companies that we work with is just 6%. 6%. Yeah. Right. So they say, okay, 6%, that's it. I just go ahead and do that. And that's the, the reason behind that because all their colleagues do the exact same thing. But why aren't you putting 10? Why aren't you putting 15? It really should be the maximum amount of money you could possibly put. It shouldn't just be a number of 6%. Well, and this is where maybe it's not an IQ thing, Sam, but you know, you, you have kids. I have one kid and um, I, I'm sure you're just like me. You know, we have conversations about money with our kids while we're driving, you know, them to their next sporting event, right? So one of the things that I do with my daughter is that I try to get her to understand that, hey, putting money away, saving it is a normal thing. It's not an abnormal thing. I was raised, I, I don't know if, I, if my parents tried to teach me this, but I was raised, but by the time I was done being raised, I was thinking, I'm going to spend every penny I got. That was my norm. Yeah. Even though my parents didn't do that, but it just wasn't ingrained in me. So, you know, parents out there, you can teach your kids I and mean, you got to start with yourself. If you're not doing it, you got to put money away, but your kids need to be learning that, hey, it's not that you put away 6%. How about the norm being you put away between 25 to 50% of what you make for future, for, for retirement? And if you can do that, then you have a shot at retiring, not at the age of 65, not necessarily at the age of 55, but maybe 45. I mean, that's completely doable. So, Make that part of your IQ is get, you know, it's, it's called it brainwash, call it whatever you want, but teach your kids that, um, you know, putting away a ton of money is a normal thing and make that your norm. It's a good point. And, uh, you know, early habits, cause this is a habit deal, early habits that you instill become habits later on in life. And Charlie Munger, you know, he came out and he's Warren Buffett's partner and he indicated one of the successful things that he has like a top 10 list of successful things that, that uh, an individual should do to, in order to incorporate success. And one of the steps was, and this is for everybody who's wealthy. And, you know, when people are, are in a position on top of the mountain, they can talk about this. <clears throat> but he said that, you know, basically we, we hear this all the time. Just don't spend more than what you make. But he takes it a step further. He takes it to the point where if you have money, if let's say you make $100,000 a year and that's net, let's just say, then your job is to only spend half of it and save the rest. And that becomes a pretty big ordeal. Back in the day, I'm probably not, you know, it's probably easier to go ahead and save half of what you make because you don't have so many of these companies, corporate America, trying to reach into your pockets to try to get more money in the form of food, form of vacation, in the form of youth sports, in the form of new cars and technology, you know? You know, Sam, I want to share an experience here. Uh, you know, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of bear my soul here and listeners, you're going to kind of know what kind of a shopper I can be at times. I'm all about being frugal and wise with money. Doesn't mean that we can't go enjoy a Morton steak dinner or buy a nice car one day when it's justified. But um, I had to go buy something. I'm not even going to mention what it was. I had to go buy an item. It's an everyday item you have around the house. Was it the Ferrari? No. <laughs> it's, what you, it's what you use to everyday clean. Item. To it's clean everyday item. It's what you use to clean the Ferrari. <laughs> Water. <laughs> Anyway, so I went to a store, like a like a regular store to buy this thing, and it was like 15 bucks, not a big deal. And then I had to go on a little shopping thing to get something for my sister. And um, I had to go to, uh, she said, you have to go to the 99 cent store. I'm like, I don't want to go to a 99 cent store, but just go to it. And that's where you'll get it for 99 cents. So I walk in there. I find the same exact product that I was going to use for the car for 99 cents instead of $15. So 
not that that's a big deal. And, you know, there's, I'm sure a lot of listeners out there that have millions of dollars and they wouldn't even think twice about spending 15 bucks for something when they can get it for nine, 99 cents. In fact, a lot of people wouldn't be caught dead walking through a 99 cent store, right? But that was me that particular day. I did go into a 99 cent store and that's perfectly fine. If you're one of those people that you just need to get started and you're not doing that, you know what? Maybe you have an IQ issue. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you need to rethink things and drop your pride and say, okay, I'm not going to spend 15 bucks on something when I can get it for 99 cents somewhere else. It's the same exact product, same brand. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I agree. And you know, a lot of times you'll see individuals though, people with means, people with wealth uh, don't necessarily need a two pound or three pound gold chain wrapped around their neck to show how much money they have. Right. And um, again, a lot of times, you have, a, you have a guy and he has an entourage of people and this entourage of people, he could be employing them, 10, 15 people around them. And the reality is, is that if you're comfortable in your own space, you don't need 15 people walking around with you telling you how great you are. Um, it's really a complex that we have in society. So, you know, we can really just go on and keep talking about this, but we want to get to these questions out to these individuals and have them test their own retirement IQ because it's really important. If they can do this in the first steps of planning for the final vacation of their life or the, I can't say the final voyage. <laughs> That's not, <laughs> don't want to say the final voyage, you know, the final approach. But no, I mean, if they can plan, if they can see and visualize the happiness that the, the longest vacation they'll ever receive and start asking themselves significant questions, they'll be able to plan for it better. All right. Well, let's, well, you clear that throat once more. Oh, I got to <laughs> tell you. What's the next question? <clears throat> you know, over okay. that little cold you had about a week and a half ago. Well, you know, this is a question and believe it or not, not a lot of people know this question and you have individuals that are professors in great schools that don't necessarily know the answer to this question. So over the past 25 years, what has the average annual rate of inflation been? You know, has it been two, has it been three, has it been five, has it been 15%? And, uh, you know, the answer is uh, that over the past 25 years, it's been, over, you know, about 3%. And then you ask yourself, well, who cares about inflation? Because if you are retiring today and you plan on staying retired and not necessarily working, you're going to have to understand that what you can afford today, that same amount of money may not be able to be affording that same thing in about 20 or 25 years. So you have to also account for inflation when it comes to your plan. You know, a lot of times, because we, we speak to people and and they're right on the cusp, you know, they're they're just making it. And that's because that's great. But Unfortunately, what if we added the inflation figure to that number? It kind of throws things off. Well, I went, so I went through McDonald's. Okay. So I went to a 99 cent store and then another day I went to McDonald's and I got to admit, I love Big Macs. But anyway, that day I didn't go get a Big Mac. I had to go get a breakfast for my daughter who was off to a golf tournament and we had nowhere else to go. We had to get something real quick. I could not believe the price of one, just one sandwich and a hash brown. It came out, I forget now, I think it was like nine eight bucks, 50, eight, yeah, yeah. 850 or nine bucks. Yeah. And I asked a girl at, at the, um, the drive through window, what's going on here? Why are the prices like becoming so Oh, like she knows. <laughs> no, she did. Oh, she did. Here's the interesting oh, wow. part. She, she kind of looked at me and smiled. She goes, it's because our minimum wage went up. Oh. And she said, I could buy these meals for myself because I was making more money. But after several months of that, I can no longer afford them anymore because McDonald's raised the prices of these things that I, for a while, could afford. But my minimum wage no longer covers it anymore. No. She doesn't buy that stuff anymore. But anyway, inflation, it happens in a lot of different forms. It can be you know, food, gas, uh, housing, all kinds of things. But yeah, I would say, Sam, that inflation seems, at least in California, seems higher than the 2 to 3% number, you know? We're seeing a lot of things go up in cost. Oh, uh, it's, it's well, at least in California, it's pretty ridiculous. That's why we're seeing a record amount of people in doing this as long as we've been doing this. We, we've seen a record amount of people leaving California upon retirement. Absolutely. You know, so, you know, here's another question you want to ask yourself. If you delay, and this is right up your alley code, social security and everything. If you delay claiming your social security benefits by two years. Okay, by two years, by approximately what percentage will your payment increase by? Would it be, would your payments Anywhere? increase? Yeah. Yeah, it would. The more you delay. So it depends. I mean, I'm not going to get <laughs> technical here, but it's, it'll be between 12% and 16% if you wait two years. 
Right. Well, okay. So if you wait two years no. from the age of 62, which is the earliest, then it would be about 12%. Okay. You, you would increase your benefits by about 12%. Right. Right. Okay. And so what's the significance of that? Why should anyone care about it? Well, you know, there's not a lot of things that are guaranteed in life. And I, would, I wouldn't even say Social Security is guaranteed because, as you all know, there's a funding issue. But um, as long as they don't change the laws and as long as they, they're able to pay, that's a, you know, almost a guaranteed uh, rate of return by the government. Right. That's and, a pretty good return. And if you think about it, if it affects you, like, for instance, in Social Security at, at the age of 62, if you need to take it at 62 and you're getting $1,500 a month and all you need is $2,500 a month to live off of, then that just means that you just got to try to figure out where that other thousand dollars a month is going to come from, as opposed to the situation where you're going to require your portfolio, your investments to generate twenty five hundred a month. That might just be too much strain on that portfolio. Kind of think of it this way: if you've got a car that can only go forty five miles an hour, and you need to go sixty miles an hour, you're going to blow the car up. It ain't going to happen. So a, a nice way to go ahead and handle this is to take you know part of your Social Security in the in the formula of fifteen hundred dollars a month if you're gonna, if you need it at sixty two, and if you only needed twenty five hundred a month, just find the other thousand dollars somewhere. And if your portfolio is able to handle that, you're fine. And also, I mean, hey, it's not that bad to go ahead and take a get a job that pays a thousand dollars a month as well. Something that you may want to do. Well, I think a lot of people when they retire, they want to do something, and often it follows their passions. And when they find something that that, that satisfies their passion, they end up getting paid by, they get offered to take a salary or, or a wage. So there's a lot of people we know, a lot of people that are retired doing that. I mean, there's, there's a guy that we know, he's a retired oil executive. I don't know which company, but he's very, very successful and took a job as a greeter at Walmart in Oklahoma. And yeah, loved it. Right. Because he would just want to say hi to all his people that he grew up with and, you know, they're still there. Right, right. And, and there's a guy who uh, we ran into and he was a former software developer up in Silicon Valley. And uh, basically, he, ba- he said, listen, in the first five years of doing what he's doing, because he's a young guy, the first five years of doing what he was doing, he already attained more money than he could ever dream of. So where was he? He was a marshal at a golf course. And, and he was just driving around talking to people and he enjoyed a really young guy, but he made his money and he just chose to pay down his debt, get out of the rat race and just do what he wanted to do. And he figured, why not golf? Because he can also get a discount at the golf course. Man, that's one happy dude. I call him Dan, the man with a nice suntan. There you go. Exactly. Right. <laughs> you know, we, we talked about that. I think another question that I think people really should ask themselves is, you know, let's say you're 65 years old. And you're retiring today, right? Because a lot of people, they could be married. And these, well, of course, this is for the people that are married, looking to retire. And they're, they're in that retirement red zone. If you're a 65-year-old couple and you're retiring today, approximately how much can they anticipate spending on health care in retirement? Ooh, dog. Uh, what, 50 grand? No. 75? That's, no. Well, I'm going to go extreme. Keep I'm gonna going. Go, Keep well, going. I'm going to go really extreme here. Don't tell me it's over at least two hundred fifty thousand bucks for a couple. Yeah, I would say you can almost double that. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be pricey. I'd say at least three fifty. Yeah. yeah. Well, Maybe. when you double two fifty, because it's half a million. I, I wasn't very good at math. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that that was the, the math was my. Hey, my that's forte. my line, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the agent that's not <laughs> yeah. good at math. <laughs> No, that was math was what saved me on the SAT. It was the English that killed me. But um, <laughs> but yeah, yes, you are right, Sam. Two fifty times two is half a million. But I think when it when it comes to couple, there's some uh, economy of scale, so it may not quite come out to to half a million. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Try, try to come back at that one, there, bro. Well, I'll come back. I was deficient <laughs> both in math and in English on the SAT. So, you know, I mean, $250,000 at the very least, right? And this is one key thing is that if you're retired, let's just say you're 65 years old and you're married, both of you are 65. The question that you want to ask yourself right now is, do you have $250,000 at the very least in your portfolio? Because that's what you're going to need in medical expenses. That's just for medical. Yeah. So let's just say you have $260,000. Good job on covering the medical part, but the extra $10,000 that you got, you don't have too much of a leeway to take care of yourself as far as income. You'll be living off of Social Security. And if you're okay with Social Security and you have no debt, then you're going to be fine. Uh, but there might be free health care for all here pretty soon. <laughs> Never mind the fact that 
our taxes will be at 90%. <laughs> we, we tell people, we show them a graph, but people still are, are amazed that at one particular point in this society, in, this, in our economy, many, many years ago, taxation, taxes were at 90%. The, the highest marginal tax rate was a 90%. Yeah, over 90. Yeah, yeah. And people say, this is impossible. It's like, no. And then we show them that tax rate. It's like, yeah, wow. Well, what's pretty- interesting, there's a big part of our population that is actually embracing that idea once again in a, in a very socialized manner. Right, so, right, right. But so, yeah, I, I mean, uh, we can go on and on here. How many more cues we want to cover? I mean, I think we're getting close to our, our time here. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, throughout the podcast, several podcasts, we're going to continue to keep coming up with questions that you should always constantly ask yourself because part of this podcast really is to help you stimulate the mind. And we want people to listen. We want to create contrast. We want you to challenge the status quo. We want you to understand that things aren't necessarily always black and white. You don't have to necessarily keep following the road that you've been following. As a matter of fact, Coz and I want you to follow a new road. And this particular road that we want you to follow is actually going to lead you to the Wizard of Oz. And that wizard is going to provide you with a lot of goodies, but you're going to have to find him behind the curtain. Because there's a lot of things in society and in life, right, Because where it's not everything as what it seems. You've got to really dig and dig and dig, and that's what we try to do. We try to help individuals find some of the truths that are out there in society because we've been brought up to realize that, well, for one big thing, debt is okay. My next-door neighbor has debt. My mom has debt. My dad has debt. My friends have debt. That's okay. Well, guess what? It's not okay. It's not okay for you to be a part or I, I would say a subject or a victim of the psychological, call it manipulation, but that's what it seems like that the system does to all of us or tries to do to all of us. And it's he or she who understands that, but as Sam said, that is not your friend. And there's many other things that uh, you don't want to accept as a friend, but you probably do. For instance, accepting the fact that you have to pay Uncle Sam for the rest of your life. It's not necessarily Uh, The case, you don't necessarily need to be doing that, but it takes planning. So we would like you to become actually angry for the system taking advantage of you and leading you down the wrong path. And part of this show is dedicated to correcting that wrong so that you can get angry and start making things right so that years down the road, you're no longer an angry person. You are a happy person and you've got control of your life. And now your your family members are, are just happily living day to day. I think we should really change the name of the show to uh, We Want You to See Red. Yeah. You got to be angry in the beginning. Yeah, because if, if things aren't right. You know, it's it's interesting. And finishing up this, um, I was speaking to a uh, few people yesterday. And, you know, people forget that professional athletes, such as like Michael Jordan, they've got to fail several times in order to, you know, climb the mountaintop and actually stay there. And uh, people forget that he had to go through Boston, you know, the Boston Celtics. He had to go through the Detroit Pistons and in, in order for him to win how his many, first. How many times did he, did he, I think you said he went to the NBA finals a number of times. The, uh, oh, no, the Eastern Conference, conference yeah, playoffs. Conference, but How many times in I a row? I think it was five or six in a row. He lost to Bo- the five in a row. He lost to Boston, and, and then he lost to Detroit. And then he finally you know, beat Detroit, and then he won his championship. But that just encouraged him more and more and more to work hard, and it focused the team, and it right. made them more upset, more angry at themselves because of all the hard work. And so we oftentimes need contrast. And what's the thing that I say? You cannot climb a mountain with smooth sides. You know, we need ruggedness. We need a little sandpaper from time to time to sharpen our edges. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people are walking through this zombified life that, hey, that's okay because everyone has it. No, it's not okay. You got to remember, you got to get that out of your head because if you make $5,000 a month and that $5,000 a month, 4999 of it goes to all, you know, servicing debt then you're doing something wrong. But if you got that 5000 a month and there's no debt and that 5000 is all yours, it's just a liberating feeling. So anyways, that's uh, pretty much our show. Until next time, right, Coase? That's right. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back with our next podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs> see, you at, see you at the top. Hey, guys, thank you so much. This was fantastic. One thing that I always think about uh, when I'm listening to you is the fact that you you want to tackle debt as though uh, you're you're a soldier, right? And you're you're doing two things. You've got your weapons that you can fight against it, and then you've also got to have that armor that protects you against it. And you spoke a lot about that today, and I find that fascinating uh, with society. So I appreciate it, and I know that all the listeners do as well. And so I just want to thank you.
And I want to thank you all for listening to the Financial Liberty Project with Sam Legaspi and Ko Sukumoto. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Sam and Ko's come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And if you know somebody that needs to get equipped uh, to battle debt and to protect themselves from debt and, and listen to these questions and, and be able to answer them for themselves, please share this podcast with them. It's going to be very valuable, and they'll thank you later. And again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at the Financial Liberty Project, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. It's that time again where the call of the open road makes its way. We hope good fortune finds you on your own personal road. And until next time, we thank you for listening to the Financial Liberty Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available.